1931, the Jesuit paleontologist Pierre Taylor de Chardin published an essay entitled The Spirit of the Earth. He proposed that every small bit of matter from cells to pieces of flint, from each living organism to the whole entire earth has consciousness. Earth is alive and aware. And I would say that earth and every element that lives within her wants to be known. Earth seeks our admiration, our care. So does the nesting house finch, the blooming poppy, the fleeing deer. They all want us to know them. I would even go so far as to say that the earth knows herself through us. Perhaps the whole universe does. Imagine looking up into the dark and naming a star. You could call it flint of whalebone or dream coin of the moon. Maybe that star just named itself and used you to do it. Maybe it spoke through you for a moment. There is a sacred reciprocity. May we believe in a thrusting back and forth between us and all of Earth's living beings. <laughs> I wanted to welcome, this is my new musical group that I'm in, called Raven's Four. And we're going to be singing a song called Earth Song by Frank Tishani. And I am actually going to request that you not use your percussion instruments. It would actually throw us off, and you'll see why. <laughs> it would throw us off. See? 
Joy. Would you like to come up? Imagine a classroom of small children with their little hands over their little hearts reciting this. I pledge allegiance to the earth and all the life in which it supports. One planet in our care, irreplaceable with sustenance and respect for all. Now that's a pledge of allegiance I can get behind. <laughs> For my bachelor's degree, I went to the California Institute of Integral Studies. And one of my cohort mates, Sierra, blew me away with this very simple but profound language semantic to which for me was a revelation. She asked, why do we say the earth, but we never say the Saturn, the Neptune, the Mars, the Uranus, the Jupiter, the Mercury, the Venus? Why do we say the earth? The moon, the sun. <laughs> well, as I understand it, um, putting an article the or the in front of a noun grammatically objectifies it. It makes the noun an object, an object that can be used or acted upon, like a resource, something that is other than the subject, a subject being one who does an action, a subject acts upon an object. Sierra also pointed out this propensity to use a lowercase e when the word earth is earth's name. It's a proper noun, right? And so it gets to have that distinction of having a capitalized first letter, like all the other planets in our solar system. Now word earth with a lowercase e means dirt or ground, and that's perfectly fine. But let's be clear, when we talk about Earth, our home planet, then use a capital E to designate it as a proper noun, and it deserves that respect and regard as our language offers. And now that I've mentioned it to you, I can guess that you will see this distinction all over things that you read. And I think you'll be surprised at how often Earth is spelled with a small e or has the, um, has the article the in front of it. As for me, I make no bones about it. I read with a pen in hand and I do small edits along the way. <laughs> I thank Sierra for that insight. Um, but see, I mentioned this because nuances and subtleties matter. They sink in and they add up and they influence how we reference and understand things. Nuances and subtleties touch us on a subconscious level and inform how we respond to and regard life around us. So, this little expose is my small attempt to bring this to a level of conscious awareness. Because respecting our earth is the most important thing we could ever do. To have an honorific regard and relationship with a life giver, a life sustainer, this entity that is truly the source of existence for humanity, and it is essential. 
honoring the integrated complexity and phenomenal details of earthly existence is equal to expressing gratitude for each breath of air, each morsel of food we put in our mouth, and all the resources that are extracted and reformulated and formed into things that we consider necessities of life. A roof over our head, a table and chairs, <laughs> transportation, clean clothes, even bathing and brushing our teeth is worthy of praise and gratitude. What about a meditation on a single maple leaf in its year-long journey as a part of a deciduous tree? How about that relatively new discovery of mycelium and the way redwood trees communicate with each other? Or insects and their myriad ways of being how about honoring the collection of their little dead insect bodies mixed with wood bits and cosmic debris that makes a rich and fertile soil for us to plant and grow things. And the amazement goes on and on and on into infinity. One of the Dharma teachings in Buddhism is to recognize the dependent origination, meaning everything that exists is dependent upon something else. Dependent origination is a doctrine of causality, a system of thought that maintains that everything has been caused into existence. There is absolutely nothing on earth that exists solely of its own volition. And I love this quote by John Muir. When one tugs at a single thing in nature, they find it attached to the rest of the world. The Unitarian Universalist approach to dependent origination is in our seventh principle, the interdependent web of existence, of which we are a small but significant part. And the first source, direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures which move us to a renewal of spirit and an openness to the forces that create an uphold life. This is how Unitarian Universalists compose prose to describe ah, that amazing thing that is existence. And I propose because it is awesome, it is also sacred. I hold that life in its complexity from the macro to the micro into the far wide reaches of this exponentially expanding cosmos down to the absolute center of earth, which could contain a whole other universe. And admittedly, it is beyond my capacity or cognitive understanding of the vastness of it all. And because of this vast mystery, I want to call it sacred, holy, divine, worthy of worship, reverence, and especially protection from forces that would abuse or defile. Earlier, we sang the song, Earth Was Given as a Garden. And this sentiment comes from the biblical approach that Earth was given to humanity and that we were to have dominion over it. But there's another approach that modern thinkers have suggested. And I venture to say, this is what the biblical God had offered for humankind. We are to have stewardship. <laughs> we are to be stewards and we are to look after earth, be responsible for its care, supervise how we use things that have an impact on earth and that we collect resources for our own selves. Especially how non-human beings 
are being used because we need to work in a spirit of wholeness, not toward irreparable destruction. And a concept that must be lifted up and remembered is that earth and earthly beings beyond human beings have every right to their own existence and does not need human permission. <laughs> what a concept. So I want to complete my message this morning by quoting Brian Thomas Swimmon and Mary Evelyn Tucker again, because I really couldn't recommend this book more highly. It's amazing. Wonder is not just another emotion. It is rather an opening into the heart of the universe. Wonder is the pathway into what it means to be human, to taste the lusciousness of sun-ripened fruit, to endure the bleak agonies of a heartbreak, to exult over the majesty of existence. Surrounded by such magnificence, we could ask ourselves this question. Can we find a way to sink in deeply into these immensities? And if we can, will this enable humans to participate in the flourishing of life? Food for thought. Blessed be.